Ugh, another Ancient Egypt history video? Not again. Hey, 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 don't click off the video. I get where you're coming from, but just hold on, please. Just hear me out. We're not here to talk about the history of Ancient Egypt. No? Nah, that one is already too well known. Then what are we here for? Thanks for asking, viewer. We are here to talk about the history of Kemet, not Ancient Egypt. Huh? Isn't the history of Kemet the same as that of Ancient Egypt? What's the difference there? I'm glad you asked. Well, the difference is that the history of ancient Egypt is a well-known fictional invention devised by Egyptology to fool everybody into thinking that ancient Egypt is a Near Eastern civilization that just happened to be on African soil. This fictional version of history contains heresies such as that the originators of that civilization came from Asia and Europe and not Africa. It also contains other heresies such as the Egyptians had a tanned olive skin, that they spoke a Semitic language, and so on. This version of history is also where fictional reasons are made up in order to avoid reality. You could compare this version of history to a fictional historical novel or movie. Though some things might be factual in it, the story there remains loosely based on what actually happened. This version can be found in many Western countries' high school history books, Wikipedia articles, popular Western YouTube history videos, documentaries, and so on. Whereas the history of Kemet is a lesser known factual version of the history of that region which is purposely hidden from the public by you know who in order to keep a certain dying narrative alive. This lesser known history is the one we are going to present here in order to dispel some of the lies that have been spread throughout the years by mainstream media and modern scholarship of the past 200 years. In this version of history, facts such as the physical location, culture, name of the civilization are not altered to fit a certain narrative. This version is also where fictional explanations are not produced in order to evade from the facts. This is also the version of history where the real name of the civilization is applied at all times. So from this point forward, you will only hear me use the real name of ancient Egypt, which is Kemet, instead of the Greek invented name of Egypt. This version is also the one hidden away in big encyclopedias, rare documentaries, shadow banned history books and so on. That is the version we are going to present in this short series of the history of the land known as Kemet. In this part 1 of the series, we will focus on the history of Kemet, part 2 will focus on the peopling and part 3 will focus on some lesser known achievements of the people of Kemet. Disclaimer. All the resources used to make this video are listed and linked in the description below. So feel free to check them out in order to make sure that there is documentation for what will be said here. Alright, with that said, let's begin our video. So in the last video, we talked about the oldest African civilization, that is Taseti, Kemet's older sister. Today we're going to talk about Africa's greatest ancient civilization, Kemet. And in order to do so, we first need to talk about its history. Therefore, let's get into the first part of our series, A Brief History. Kemet's history, according to the fictional version, starts around 3100 BC and ends around 30 BC. That is of course a mere fiction. This chronology is just used in order to downplay the seniority of this great civilization. Kemet's history is actually from 4000 BC to 500 BC. In this factual chronology, we exclude the Ptolemaic period because it is no longer Kemet at that point. It is more like Egypt around that time. Although the natives of the land who still lived there continued calling themselves Kemtu in order to differentiate themselves from the Eurasian invaders. However, by that Egyptian period, none of them would hold significant power over their ancestral land. The history of Kemet first begins in the region of Taseti, 
This region was where many African groups coming from the Green Sahara and the Great Lakes region in East Africa converged and started developing agriculture, basic pottery, and astronomical knowledge between 10,000 BC and 7,000 BC. By 5,000 BC, as those people of the Nile Valley kept progressing into fully fleshed civilizations, the Kingdom of Tassiti was now coming into existence with strong rulers. And by 4,000 BC, the now fully formed Kingdom of Tassiti, with its powerful rulers, had dominion over the southern part of the Nile Valley. So they saw fit to let some of their people go north and colonize the region further north in what would later become Upper Kemet. These people who first settled into the northern part of the Nile Valley were known to the Kemites as the Aunu or the Anu people of the Terra Neter. This piece of evidence was found by famous British Egyptologist Flinders Petrie. So some of these Egyptologists do come in handy. When you look at the Aonu chief's face, you easily notice that it is a black man being depicted. This adds to the evidence that the first settlers of Kemet were black Africans. And this is also supported by recent anthropometric studies of the Nakta skeletons and the Badarian skeletons as well. These Nakta skeletons and Badarian skeletons are skeletons from Kemet's pre-dynastic period. This is where the Kemites originate. This is where their story begins. During the pre-dynastic period, we have what the scholars call the Nakta culture, which lasted from 4000 BC to 3100 BC. This version of event of the origin of the Kemites is the one that is based on evidence. The other version is merely a fiction that they try to pass as factual. The fiction being that the Eurasians coming from the north were the originators of Kemet, a big fat lie of course. I call it fiction because it isn't supported by any evidence we currently possess. That conclusion is simply the work of creative storytellers who are not comfortable with an African origin of the Kemetic civilization and not the work of serious historians who are merely concerned with the facts at hand. As Dr. Diop stated in his book, The African Origin of Civilization, and I paraphrase here, there is no evidence for a northern or Eurasian origin of Kemet. Most of the evidence points towards an African origin coming from the south and from the Sahara, since all the early chronological history of Kemet can be reconstructed only because of the evidence found in Upper Kemet, that is, the southern part of the kingdom, whereas Lower Kemet, the northern part, yields little to no evidence for the earlier history of Kemet. This is a simple fact. Some storytellers say that's because most of the evidence there was destroyed by water in the delta. Do they have any evidence to back this claim? They do not. All they can do is hope it is true. While Upper Kemet has yielded the evidence for the earliest pharaohs, hieroglyphs, and earliest royal cemeteries. One cannot compete with that. Ancient sources also supported the view that the Kemites came from the south then came north later. According to Herodotus, for example, he states that the Kemites told him that the area of the delta was not habitable in the beginning of their civilization. They only spread there later on. Even modern science supports the view that the early Kemites were simply people of Tasseti. This is showcased by studies of Shomaka Keita, who showed how the pre-dynastic skeletons were akin to people of Tasseti, that is the Nubians. This evidence is also presented in a video I made about the originators of Kemet. You can go check that out on my channel. Moving on. So from 4000 BC to 3200 BC, we are in the pre-dynastic period of Kemet. This period is divided into three parts, Nakta 1, Nakta 2, and Nakta 3. There is also an earlier culture known as the Badarian culture from 4400 BC to 4000 BC, but not much is known about their history. All we know is that they were not nomads and that they were more similar to the people of that city in regard to their skeletal structure and even their culture. Also, we know that some of them had red hair, and this fact has been used by the fictional version of the story to claim that they were Europeans. However, these fictional storytellers seem to ignore that there are many peoples in East Africa 
who have red hair or use hina, a very ancient practice found in that specific region, to make their hair turn that color. The Badarians were certainly Africans. However, their culture does not seem to have had as much influence on what would later become Dynastic Kemet. This role belongs to the Nakta culture, which lasted from 4000 BC to 3200 BC. This Nakta culture had direct influence on what would later become Dynastic Kemet. Even the fictional version of the story had to admit that this culture is where Dynastic Kemet was born. So by this point, the Kemites still don't have pharaohs and such. However, their region is still ruled by petty lords until the shift into a semi-state by the end of Nakta II around 3500 BC and then by Nakta III in 3400 BC, we see the emergence of a proper state writing, Kemetic architecture, arts, iconography and so on. And all this was achieved, it is important to note, by the fact that the Happy River, that is the Nile River, was a sweet spot for the Kemites and the Kushites that allowed them to develop complex civilizations some of the first civilizations in the world, probably the first and the second. This occurred because the discovery of irrigation techniques allowed the Kemites and the Kushites to spend less time in the field and spend more time developing other fields such as massive stone constructions, acquiring more scientific knowledge, arts, religious thoughts and all the other things those two civilizations are known for. After the pre-dynastic period, we then enter the dynastic period, initiated by the ruler Menes, coming from Upper Kemet and descended from the Nakta people. This period begins around 3200 BC and is divided into three main periods, with an intermediate period after each of them. These main periods are the Old Kingdom, the Middle Kingdom, and the New Kingdom. The fictional version also adds a late period, which I like to call the No Longer Kemet period. So let's quickly go over each of these periods, except the late one because it's No Longer Kemet. First we have the Early Dynastic period, also known as the Thanite period. This is a short period that preceded the Old Kingdom and only lasted two dynasties from 3150 BC to 3686 BC. This is where we get the first great pharaohs who united the two lands of Upper and Lower Kemet, with some notable pharaohs such as Menes, known as the founder of Dynastic Kemet. This period is where most of the concepts that would later govern Kemet and turn it into the great civilization it was were established. Concepts such as the God King, that is the belief that they are pharaohs, were gods on earth, a concept that is present in many other African kingdoms as well. Other various religious concepts were also from this period. The fine arts of Kemet were also from this period. The sophisticated architecture and technology and scientific knowledge of the Kemites were all established here in this early dynastic period. After this period, we have the Old Kingdom from 2686 BC to 2181 BC. This is where the pyramid builders reigned. These are the glory days of Kemet. This period is the one that gave Kemet its iconic buildings such as the Great Pyramids of Giza and its great temples. The rulers of this period were also ridiculously rich and they also had unprecedented control over their population which allowed them to build ridiculously huge structures such as the Pyramids of Giza. I mean this was the first time rulers had so much control over a population and convinced them to build such great structures. This old kingdom period counted four dynasties. Some notable pharaohs of this period are Djoser with his stepped pyramid at Saqqara and his mortuary temple which is considered the first stone building in the world. This pharaoh is also the one that had the genius Imhotep as his counselor. Hmm, the lucky guy. Another pharaoh is Khufu, who built the first Great Pyramid of Giza, his son Khafre, who built the second Great Pyramid, and Menkaura, who built the third Great Pyramid of the Giza Plateau. Their period was the apex of pyramid building. I mean, just look at those three pyramids. So symmetrical, so well aligned, and so beautiful, magnificent. And they still stand to this day, almost 5,000 years later. That's saying something about the engineers who built those things. 
Another notable pharaoh is Unas. His tomb is the first in the world where one can find the concept of resurrection and prayers that are suspiciously identical to those found in the Bible, a document which came thousands of years later. Hmm, I believe some people have some things to answer for. Anyways, the Old Kingdom period is also the period when the greatest genius of all time, Imhotep, lived. Imhotep was the first ever polymath of this world. He was a complete genius and a scientist. He was an architect, a mathematician, an engineer, a doctor of medicine, a high priest of Kemet, which in Kemet usually means you're a scientist and a philosopher. He was an astronomer, a scribe, and a sculptor of great stone monuments, which basically means he was a great architect. Imhotep was the man who conceptualized and built the world's first ever pyramid and stone structures. Can you imagine his mathematics and physics knowledge? To have built this almost 5,000 years ago, he really was something else. Another thing Imhotep was known for was his medicinal knowledge. It was so great in fact that he was later deified by the ancient Greeks under the name of Asclepius. In Kemet, Imhotep was often associated with the god of science and writing Jehuti, that is the god thought. And lastly, I think this is important to note about Imhotep because of modern media portrayals of this great genius. Imhotep was a black man. The features on his statues and depictions all show this. He was a typical black African. Just ask the YouTube channel Mr. Imhotep, he will tell you all about this great genius. Imhotep is my favorite Kemite, by the way. I love this man. I would have probably been one of the people that went to pay him homage at Saqqara. Such a great mind. Who could resist? I know I wouldn't. I'd probably be like one of his fanboys. <laughs> Alright. After the Old Kingdom, we then have the First Intermediate Period. This is a period of great political instability in the history of Kemet. This period is when the concept of Ma'at, the concept of stability, was broken. The authority of the god king was challenged by that of the provincial governors of each region, which are known as Noms. This instability lasted about 140 years until it was brought to an end by princes from Upper Kemet. So once again, Upper Kemet brings order and stability to the two lands, just as it did in the beginning. And this, my friends, will be a recurring theme, as you will see further in this video. And also something important to note about these rulers of the Middle Kingdom is that they were also undeniably black Africans. And to prove this, one just has to look at the first pharaohs of this period. For instance, Mentuhotep I, the second and the third, all pharaohs of the 11th dynasty, all clearly black and African in all their features. Even the subsequent 12th and 13th dynasty had obvious looking black pharaohs. One cannot talk about white pharaohs here, but still they do. But we're not here to talk about that, we're here to talk about the history, so let's focus on the history. The 11th, 12th and 13th dynasty all belong to the Middle Kingdom period. This period did not last very long however, from 2040 BC to 1782 BC. Some notable pharaohs of this period are Mentuhotep I who reunified the two lands and gave Kemet another period of great prosperity and restored the concept of Ma'at over the two lands. Another pharaoh is Sinazret III, or Senwoset III, who built the Buhen Fortress, the world's first ever castle, which preceded those of Europe by a whopping 3,200 years. Yes, that's right. There were castles in Africa before there were any castles in Europe. This Buhen Fortress was built to deal with the Kushite threat in the south. We talked about this in our previous video about the Kingdom of Tasseti, another mighty African kingdom with two lands as well. Another important ruler of this period was the pharaoh Sobek Neferu. She is the first woman to ever take the full royal title of Kemet. Again, this showcases the ability for Africans to easily follow a woman when she is the one in line. This Middle Kingdom period was brought to an abrupt end by the Second Intermediate Period, which lasted from 1782 BC to 1570 BC. In this period, the concept of Ma'at was once again broken 
by the invasion of Asiatic foreigners who had been steadily infiltrating the land of Kemet as servants, mercenaries and traders for quite some time. This period is where one can find the Hyksos dynasties, a period of foreign pharaohs who caused a lot of misery to the inhabitants of the land of Kemet according to the historian Manetho. Under the rule of these foreign pharaohs, nothing of consequence was built in Kemet and that is probably due to the fact that the locals did not consider them legitimate to the rule so they were probably unwilling to work for these guys and do their best. They contributed nothing positive to the development of Kemet, in fact they brought nothing new to Kemet. Now these were the Caucasian pharaohs of Kemet, the one the fictional version often tends to ignore. After this period of instability came a new dynasty from Thebes that brought back stability and Maat to the land once again. This was once again a group of Kemite royal princes from Upper Kemet bringing back Maat to the two lands of Kemet. I told you it was a recurring theme didn't I? And this new stability brought about the new kingdom period ushered in by Pharaoh Amose I of the 17th dynasty. This period lasted from 1570 BC to 1070 BC. This period is where one finds Kemet's new greatest achievements. They expanded their rule even further and built an empire. During this period, architecture boomed as well with magnificent temples built with granite and stone. Beautiful huge obelisks were built that had never been seen before in the world. Great cities were built here too. More wealth was acquired and more massive temples and fortresses were built as well. Kemet really was at the top of the ancient world here. Everyone wanted to be like Kemet at this point. What they had done up to this point was unprecedented, never seen before in this world. This period is also where the most famous pharaohs are from. Pharaohs like Hatshepsut, a female ruler who expanded the empire through trade unlike her male counterparts who extended it through war. She also built massive temples and invested in many architectural projects. I really like this pharaoh. She is one of my favorite pharaohs. Another pharaoh is Thutmose III who was the greatest conqueror of Kemet. Ramses II who was a great soldier often compared to Alexander the Great. Ramses II is probably one of the most famous pharaohs and he won a lot of battles. Another famous pharaoh of this period is our boy Tutankhamen, the boy pharaoh who died at 17. Famous for having so much drip in his tomb that one of his sarcophagus was made out of solid gold. People have toilet out of gold, he has a whole sarcophagus. Have you seen the size of sarcophagus? They can take a human body inside of it. Mm -hmm. And he had one in gold, solid gold. Another pharaoh of this period is Ramses III who is known for being the last great Kemite pharaoh of Kemet before its end. Two other people worth noting of this period because they are just so famous is King Akhenaten and his Queen Nefertiti. This period is also where you see a lot more mixed race rulers and servants as more and more Eurasians were coming to Kemet to settle. Also with political marriages, with pharaohs bringing in queens from abroad, you have more mixing in this period since it was the spot of the ancient world to be at. This period is also the last one with native Kemite pharaohs and it was brought to an end by Persian invaders who brought great suffering to the land. Land. These Persian rulers did nothing to improve the land, they did nothing but destroy the religion, culture, wealth and the population of Kemet. They contributed nothing new to the land and culture, they built nothing new, in fact they destroyed more. And this led to the third intermediate period from 1069 BC to 525 BC. This is a period where Kemites suffered terribly under Persian rule. However, this cruel period of time was brought to an end for about a century by the last great African pharaohs of Kemet, the 25th dynasty of the Kushite pharaohs led by King Payanke who brought back Maat to the land. Once again, the ones who restored stability and the concept of Maat to the land of Kemet came from further south. While all Kemet got from the north was invasion upon invasion and oppression. 
King Payanke did not invade Kemet for profitable reasons as the fictional version would have you believe. King Payanke came to Kemet to restore Ma'at to the land of its rival sister country because he saw that she was under great instability and suffering. But this Kushite rule was brought to an end when they lost their dominion over the land of Kemet to the Persian invaders. And just like that, it was the end of Kemet. What a great and mighty history it had. I call the 25th dynasty the one dynasty from the south that moved up north and to tell their cousins, the Egyptians, how to rule a nation one more time in the great show of history this was Africa's last walk in the sun it was a great and mighty walk that walk had lasted 10,000 years now it's coming to an end Europe is just being born the very word Europe it's not even being used. After the Kemet period, then comes the history of what the Greeks called Egypt and what the fictional version, the late period of Kemet, which I like to call the no longer Kemet period since the natives of the land were defeated and pushed out. By then, the land was occupied by foreigners Nothing new came out of it because the natives had dwindled, their genius crushed by barbaric invasions from the north, their once great technology lost and destroyed by the invaders. And all that was left to remind us of Kemet on the land we now call Egypt was Kemet's great legacy. And this, my friend, was the factual history of Kemet. There are many more facts about it that I would love to tell you about but I can't because this video would be far too long. And that's why I invite you to go check the description below for interesting books on Kemet's history. This was part one of this short series about the history of Kemet. Join me in part two, where we will focus on the peopling of Kemet. There is a lot to say there too, since a lot of lies are flying around about who the Kemites really were. So stay tuned for that too. Also, check out Mr. Imhotep's YouTube channel for more content and facts about the history of Kemet. I'm sure you'll enjoy what you will learn over there if you haven't already. And if you're still here watching this video, please be sure to like, comment and subscribe to this channel. Peace.